Welcome. In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of Chapter 4, Dispute Settlement and Sanctions. We'll begin with the distinction between diplomatic and legal means of dispute settlement, but before that, let me just settle uh, what is an international dispute. Now, according to one of the foremost scholars in this field, uh, Professor Merrills, a dispute is, as you can see, a specific disagreement on a matter of fact, law, or policy, where you have a dialectic process between a claim or an assertion of one party on the one hand, and then a refusal or a counterclaim or a denial by another. Note that the subject of the dispute will be a matter of fact, law, or policy, as this will be crucial when we uh, go into dispute settlement, particularly in the substantive chapters further on in this course. As to the choice of means of dispute settlement, as you can see, the general principle is that the consent of the parties uh, is the fact is, is what determines uh, the choice of means. And this is so stated in Article 33, Paragraph 1 of the UN Charter, where you find also a role of uh, different types of dispute settlement mechanisms uh, here signed in yellow in this uh, slide. So negotiation, inquiry, uh, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or ar arrangements, and an, a, an open clause for other peaceful means uh, of their own choice, that is, of the parties to the dispute. Now, diplomatic means um, can be summed up as, as these specific types of dispute settlement. Now, with consultation, um, consultation typically occurs even before more formal means of dispute settlement are adopted, and they may actually head off a possible dispute. So uh, before the, sp the dispute escalates, consultation is always a first step. In good offices, you have a third party that establishes a communication channel between the parties, and that encourages them to uh, negotiate the dispute, and so to achieve a mutually satisfactory outcome. In mediation, the mediator, unlike the good offices, um, the mediator assumes a much more active role and may actually advance some informal proposals on his own behalf, as well as conveying the party's proposals. So the mediator is not just a go-between as it happens in good offices. Inquiry refers to a very specific type of, of diplomatic um, dispute settlement. Uh, an inquiry typically arises when facts are the, the core of the issue uh, at dispute. Um, and these facts, the um, uh, investigation of the facts, is then carried out by an independent entity such as a commission of inquiry. This is something that happens uh, quite frequently, particularly in areas like um, the downing of a plane uh, by a missile, and so a commission of inquiry is set up to determine who sh shot the missile, and so who is to blame, or uh, a naval accident. So all these uh, matters where facts are crucial to the outcome of the dispute tend to be subject to this, to this form of diplomatic means. Finally, conciliation. Now, in, in conciliation, the intermediary um, assumes a much more active role and uh, the intermediary actually investigates the dispute and presents uh, his or her own formal proposals to settle the matter. So this is no longer a matter of just simply uh, shifting between the different parties to the dispute. The conciliation uh, expert will then exercise a much more proactive role. Now, let me show you some pros and cons of diplomatic means. Um, the pros are that you have very flexible procedures. Parties retain control of the dispute. That is to say, any third party intervening, the mediator, a conciliator, does not really gain control of the dispute. So it's still up to the parties to establish how and um, with what means the dispute is going to be settled. The parties are free to accept or reject any envisaged compromise. So they do not risk losing face. And so that these are some of the pros of using diplomatic means. 
Now, for Kant, I, I signaled here what for me is the main, most significant one, and that is that uh, since we are not dealing here with legal means, so there's no way to a priori define the status of each party in the dispute, um, this means that the bargaining power of the parties will tend to reflect their relative position in the dispute. So if one of the parties is a very powerful politically, economically, militarily um, nation, um, and the other is a weak uh, partner, then uh, you can see how diplomatic means will tend to favor the more powerful party um, in, in the dispute. Now, legal means, on the other hand, involve a binding decision, typically on the basis of international law. There are two main uh, legal means of dispute settlement. The first is arbitration. So here we set up an arbitral tribunal, or the parties set up an arbitral tribunal, or they may choose an already existing one, and we will see that there are a number of existing arbitral tribunals or procedures to determine the creation of arbitral tribunals. And it's also up to the parties to define the terms of reference and the basis of the decision. And these are normally set out in a compromis, uh, that is to say the agreement that forms the legal basis, the legal foundation for the work of this arbitral tribunal. Notice that by defining the terms of reference, this implies that parties may prevent the arbitral tribunal from deciding on issues that the parties are, you know, careful not to subject to this uh, third party uh, binding decision. So they can narrow it down as to the specific parts of the dispute that they really want this intervention to settle. Finally, judicial settlement. Now in judicial set settlement, the dispute is now referred to the International Court of Justice or to another tribunal. When we talk about international arbitration, uh, we have to distinguish between uh, public arbitration, so arbitration that involves only subjects of international law, private arbitration, that is to say international commercial arbitration, and this applies to disputes between individuals or corporations, so it's not really part of the international economic law, as we defined in the first chapter. And then we have mixed arbitration that is used to settle disputes between a private party and a state. And the um, main example of this is so-called investor state dispute settlement. Notice that here you have on the one hand a state and on the other a private party. So not all the parties to the dispute are typical subjects of international law as we've seen. Let me give you some examples of mixed arbitration. Uh, so ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, that was set up by the uh, Multilateral Washington Convention of 1965, um, is one example of mixed arbitration. So um, here, in this case, a private investor may bring a case against a signatory uh, member of the convention before an arbitral tribunal set up under the ICSID rules. Now, municipal courts or local courts may only play a role in enforcement. That is to say, once you have a, an arbitral award, the execution of that award is then dependent on the, the, the courts of the contracting states. But there's no new decision as to whether or not there was liability uh, on whether or not there was a breach of the rights of the investor. So it, it's strictly for enforcement purposes. The NAFTA also includes a Chapter 11 that allows investors from one of the parties, that is Canada, Mexico, and the United States, to refer disputes on the treatment of investments in another party to arbitration. And the enforcement then follows the ICSID procedures then this NAFTA Chapter 11 is now being replaced by Chapter 14 of the 2018 U.S., Mexico, and Canada Agreement. The final example is the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and it has been involved in, in significantly uh, significant arbitration disputes, uh, such as the Bank for International Settlements Arbitration and the Eurotunnel Arbitration. 
and if you click on the links on the presentation that you have online it will take you to the websites where you have a, a brief presentation of both these different um, examples of uh, mixed arbitration. Okay, now what is the role of states in international dispute settlement? Now, even when disputes arise within the context of international organizations such as the WTO, settlement typically takes place between states or contracting parties. That is to say that often uh, dispute settlement in international economic law, uh, as in other areas of international law, is typically one of state versus state or in the case of the WTO, state or member versus member. Now, these cases um, will typically be very focused on the interests, the specific interests of the parties to the dispute. So there's no equivalent to what we have in the European Union, where the European Commission has an active role in using infringement actions under EU treaty rules in order to protect EU's legal order. So this is not the case typically when we deal with international law. There's no independent body that is supervising and bringing cases whenever it finds that member states are not complying with the organization rules. So the principle here is really one of self-help. If a member thinks that the, the, his rights and obligations under the um, relevant international agreement uh, are being um, impaired by the conduct of another party, then it's up to that state to defend its own position. Now, this international nature, international in the sense of state versus state nature of litigation, may be demonstrated by the principle of diplomatic protection. Now, moving to the principle of diplomatic protection, um, in international law, the exercise of the protection of the nationals of a given state against acts of another state is typically exercised by the state of nationality. So the individual is here seen as, as an instrument, as an extension of the state and of its interests. Now, some states dispute this, and um, the Calvo Doctrine in, in South American countries um, is an example of that, whereby aliens only have the right to national treatment. So a foreigner is not automatically entitled to um, shift the case to his state of nationality. They have to go through national courts the same way as domestic investors, for instance, in an investment dispute. So in any case, as we're going to see um, in, in the law of international responsibility of states, there is a requirement that local remedies should be exhausted before diplomatic protection may be invoked. So this goes some, some distance to uh, satisfy at least partially the so-called Calvo Doctrine. And again, in the presentation on the website, you have links for uh, a brief explanation of both the principle of diplomatic protection and the Calvo Doctrine. So... Diplomatic protection is typically a prerogative of the state of nationality. That means that whether or not a private individual may ask the state and whether the state is, is comp compelled to, to respond to that request is really a matter for domestic law. As I've underlined here, because this is a matter that will, will have a lot of importance when we look at WTO law in, in part three of our course, um, in some cases, uh, domestic law actually sets limits to the discretionary power of the state as to whether or not it should take part, it should take action on private claims. In the United States, an example of that is Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974, and this is to some extent mimicked by uh, EU Regulation 2015-1843. Uh, um, in both cases, what happens is that if, say, a U.S. firm finds that its interests um, in trade with a third country are being um, injured because of action taken by that third country, then they can make a sort of a petition before the um, U.S. bodies in charge of international trade in order to investigate the matter and possibly even to adopt measures that would um, try to sanction 
uh, possible infringement by the other party. Um, as we will see, this is very controversial because whether or not, uh, in this case, for instance, the United States has to wait for the uh, competent body, the dispute settlement body of the WTO, uh, before they take actually any make any determination that there has been a breach, or um, even worse, that they may react by adopting, for instance, unilateral measures, uh, whether or not that is compliant with the obligations of the United States in the WTO agreement. And we will look at the specific case where this was brought before a panel uh, when we deal with the dispute settlement at the WTO. Okay, so moving now to dispute settlement institutions, um, one of the key um, classifications in this area is the distinction between so-called power-oriented and rule-oriented dispute settlement. Uh, this distinction was uh, advanced by Professor John Jackson, late Professor John Jackson, uh, one of the foremost scholars in international economic law. Uh, and what it means is mostly that um, in power-oriented dispute settlement, settlement takes place through negotiation and agreement that will reflect the relative power of the parties to the dispute. Now, this tends to favor a, 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 an analysis of short-term cost-benefit, the costs versus the benefits of dispute settlement, and it does create incentives for a opportunistic behavior where bargaining power favors the state in breach of international law. So if you can look at this from the perspective of the United States, for instance, adopting measures that are of very doubtful compatibility with WTO law, but when these measures affect, say, Venezuela or um, some other developing country, obviously the bargaining power pretty much favors the United States. Whereas under a rule-oriented dispute settlement system, disputes are settled in accordance with previously agreed rules that are binding to the parties. So this is really law in the sense that there's a pre-existing law and the dispute is whether or not that law has been breached by one of the parties. Now, obviously, rule-oriented, because it's, uh, it's blind to the relative bargaining power of the states involved in the dispute, tends to favor a long-term cost-benefit analysis. And this leads to, st to the stability of the international system to be taken into account as countervailing short-term losses. That is to say, if the United States now is subject to a, a, a rule-oriented dispute settlement system, it has to consider not just the short-term benefits of uh, deviating from the rules, it also has to consider the fact that by deviating from existing rules, it is actually undermining the basis of these rules, rules that may favor it in future, may favor the United States in future disputes. So this creates a, a more institutionalized, a more settled base for dispute settlement. Now, dispute settlement institutions in, in international economic law, and these are some that we're going to look at, um, we can think of, with regard to trade, the WTO and the dispute settlement understanding, which is a very meaningful part of WTO law, one that has come under attack in, in, in recent years. We can think of bilateral investment protection treaties that provide for arbitration, either ad hoc, that is a specific tribunal uh, set up under the rules of a specific bilateral investment treaty, or using ICSID, and this is by far the most uh, expedient way to have arbitration between investors and states. Oddly enough, the IMF has no specific dispute settlement mechanism, so there's no formal mechanism to settle disputes between different members. Instead of that, what we have is something called interpretation as an institutional way to solve conflicts. We will look at that in part two of our course. Okay, moving now to, to close this chapter, uh, a few remarks on unilateral sanctions. So we've talked about dispute settlement, but then how are these dispute settles, settlements then enforced? And 
as we're going to see, unilateral sanctions play a very significant role in international law in general, but here specifically in international economic law. Now, here you have to consider that uh, sanctions uh, must be looked at from the perspective of state responsibility, so of international law on state responsibility. And I've given you here the link to the International Law Commission draft articles on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts of 2001. There are two main questions that we have to consider when we think about unilateral sanctions. The first is one of substantive legality. Is the measure adopted as a sanction a violation of international law? The second is one of procedural legality. Can the enforcement of a measure that is compatible with international law per se become a breach of international law because of how it is implemented? Is the measure justified and proportional? So these are some of the questions that we have to bear in mind when we think of unilateral sanctions. Now, unilateral sanctions are here distinguished from economic sanctions in the context of international economic organizations. And so for my final slide, um, you can think of the, these sanctions in two different areas of international law, international economic law, such as the WTO, where the dispute settlement body may allow measures to compensate the nullification or impairment of members' rights. Nullification or impairment is sort of a term of art of WTO law that we will uh, develop further on. Now, the extent of those measures, that is to say the, the, the dimension, the extent of the proportionality of these measures, is also subject to arbitration. And so in this case, the WTO, members have relinquished the right to act unilaterally. So under Article 23 of the Dispute Settlement Understanding, members may not act unilaterally in matters that are subject to WTO law. So no more unilateral action is allowed. Otherwise, unilateral action that breaches the dispute settlement understanding or WTO law in general would be a breach itself of WTO law. In the IMF, we have a different type of sanctions. Here, sanctions uh, may be applied for a breach of obligations, such as the suspension of access to IMF resources, which is obviously a very important sanction because the IMF exists essentially to provide support to members uh, in cases of, such as cases where you have uh, difficulty in terms of balance of payments. Ultimately, members may actually be expelled from the IMF, and that's the ultima ratio sanction that may be applied in the, the IMF Articles of Agreement. Okay, and this concludes this uh, chapter. So. I will see you in class. Thank you.